Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> um, I'm Neil Barclay, and I have the great privilege of being the president uh, of something <laughs> of the Charles H. Wright Museum in Detroit. Um, one of the occupational hazards, I think, of being a museum director is that you don't often get to be able to sit in a room and partake of presentations like this for a full day. So mm -hmm. it's been really great to be with all of you all. Um, Jama Jordan, hmm, where do we begin to tell the story? <laughs> you told me I wasn't supposed to read all of this, but I'm going to anyway. <laughs> um, so, you know, I started my tenure at the ride in 2019, so I'm January, so I'm approaching three years there. But one of the people that in Detroit, he's been a teacher of African and African American history for over 20 years and a researcher of black history for decades. Um, da, 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 he's taught everywhere. Um, <laughs> But he has led a series of black history classes for docents and volunteers in museums, for executives at uh, General Motors, and also has been a historical consultant for those who may need a side job uh, for the upcoming Steven Soderbergh film, <laughs> uh, No Sudden Move, which was filmed in Detroit and set in 19, the 1950s. And also for the upcoming miniseries Unruly about Jack Johnson, the first black heavyweight boxing champion of the world. But today, I, I'm, um, Jamon hopefully will share with us some um, interesting information about five, five is it? Um, institutions um, from black Detroit that will really come from this Underground Railroad tradition. So without further ado from me, Jamon. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Thank you, everyone. I'm happy to be here. And this is what I'm going to be talking about today, that freedom is the foundation, five black Detroit institutions that come from the Underground Railroad. But before I get into the presentation, I'm really going to tell you that I'm going to force, I'm imposing seven ideas on everybody today. Now, my class, I teach a class for U of M um, about Detroit's black history. For that class, I try my best not to impose my own feelings and ideas and opinions on my students. I want them to research these things and then come to their own conclusions. Um, but today, y'all not my class. I'm going to impose these ideas on you today. And one of them, the first one, is that overwhelmingly, the abolitionist movement is developed, organized, and led by black people. Um, white. Thank you, Sharon knows this. She's been doing it longer than me. Um, white abolitionist allies are important and they ought to be um, honored and they ought to be studied. But the, but the movement, especially in Detroit, is led by black freedom fighters. Two, the abolitionist movement is the best model of interracial cooperation in US history. If you don't know or understand the basics of the abolitionist movement, then you don't understand where the civil rights movement of the late 1800s and early 1900s comes from. It just comes out of nowhere if you don't know that connection. And if you don't know or understand the civil rights movement of the early 1900s, then you don't understand where the black freedom movement of the 1950s and 60s, where does that come from? Um, slavery and the Underground Railroad were not that long ago. So I'm on point four. Slavery and the Underground Railroad were not that long ago and are tied to our present reality. Five, present day social justice and civil rights activists ought to be looking at the strengths of the abolitionist movement and the Underground Railroad as the model. Six, faith. Faith is the foundation of the African American community and along with family is the foundation of the Underground Railroad. And that legacy is present with us, even in this room. And then lastly, Detroit's African-American community's origin comes from the abolitionist movement and the Underground Railroad. Black organizations, institutes, and in, in, indeed neighborhoods in Detroit, from Black Bottom to Paradise Valley to the North End to Conan Gardens to the Old West Side, and the institutions that are in those neighborhoods can be connected to the fight for freedom. Slide. 
So try not to read all this stuff because I have 45 minutes, I got 45 slides. So <laughs> that can't work. But right now, we know there's a fight, and we talked about it earlier today, that they're going on through states, cities, and school districts regarding the teaching of critical race theory. Now, critical race theory is an academic idea that analyzes the law through the lens of racial inequality. In other words, it seeks to uncover how the U.S. legal system, including policing and the criminal justice system, are intimately tied to white supremacy at the beginning of the establishment of the United States. For the most part, it's a university level scholarly analysis of history. Kindergartens aren't being taught critical race theory. But to the present opponents of critical race theory, it's being taught everywhere. They don't only bash the 1619 Project and the Teaching Hard History curriculum frameworks. They bash teaching that George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and 12 US presidents were slave owners. They don't want that to even be taught. What these critics of critical race theory are really against is teaching about the history of racism in America, which will include the history of slavery in America. Next slide. But Detroit students have rejected these myths for decades. So this is the walkout at Northern High School in April of 1966. So you see the students have made demands. They're asking for student and community control of the, school, of the uh, curriculum. And they're going to walk out for four days, led by three students, one senior, two juniors, lead the walkout in April of 1966 at Northern High School in the North End in the city of Detroit on Woodward. And their freedom, freedom school for them will be at St. Matthew, St. Joseph's Episcopal Church. That's where they'll have their freedom school. So you see students are rejecting this idea that they can't, that what we ought to be learning is, is not being taught in the school. We're going to do something about it. And even this event is tied to the history I'm talking about today. Slide. Of course, the opponents of critical race, the opponents of teaching about racism, they want the monuments without the critique of those monuments. So they don't just want the monuments. They want the monuments to not ever mention, don't have anything on them to ever tell you that other part of the history. So of course, this is the Robert E. Um, Lee Monument in Richmond, Virginia. It was removed um, just last month. And this, of course, is the monument of Christopher Columbus. It was located on Randolph and Jefferson. It was removed by the city last year. Before it was removed, of course, you can see it was targeted by numerous protests. Next slide. So much of American history is connected to slavery. The origin story of the United States has long been presented as an honorable one in which all the founders were transcendent heroes. And the way history has long been taught has been an ongoing march to progress. But both of those narratives are myths. Next slide. If we talk about the original higher education in what is now the United States, New College, which is Harvard now, College of William and Mary, Collegiate School, which is Yale, College of New Jersey, which is Princeton, King's College, which is now Columbia, the UPN, which was the College of Philadelphia, Rhode Island, College of Rhode Island, which is now Brown, Queens College, which is Rutgers, Dartmouth, um, and Georgetown. All of these colleges, these universities, are intimately tied to slavery. The donors, the founders, the first wealthy students, the buildings that were first made on those campuses, the professors, the board of trustees, many of them, and in some cases, most of them, some of the colleges, it's not even many, it's most, um, are involved directly or indirectly to the slave trade. So if the Brown brothers who own ships and are selling many of their ships to slave ship runners, or if it's Yale, where the donation of a plantation is donated to the school to fund the first graduate school at the first graduate program at Yale University. Next. Brooks Brothers, I know it's hard to see up there. On April 7, 1818, at the age of 45, Henry Sands Brooks opens H and D.H. Brooks and Company on the northeast corner of Catherine and Cherry Streets in Manhattan. He proclaimed that his guiding principle was to make and deal only in merchandise of the finest body to sell it at a fair profit and to deal with people who seek and appreciate such merchandise. In 1833, his four sons, Elisha, Daniel, Edward, and John, inherited the family business. In 1850, renamed the company Brooks Brothers. During the cotton boom of the early 1800s, Brooks Brothers was one of several prominent clothiers to manufacture clothing using ha cotton harvested by slaves, enslaved Africans. 
The company in turn told, sold clothing to the plantation owners. They were a major clothier making suits for the plantation owners. They also provided clo clo clothes made from Negro cloth, this thick cotton that would be durable so that it wouldn't have to be replaced for a long period of time. They produced this Negro cloth that was worn by the enslaved Africans. So they're clothing the plantation owners and the people working on that plantation. Next. Insurance company, Barclays Bank, not, not your family, Neil. <laughs> Barclays Bank was just one of the financiers of slavery. Other banks were involved and insurance companies were even more involved in banks. Lloyds of London became the largest finance capital in the world at one time because it made so much money insuring the British slave ships and their cargo, including their human cargo. Aetna in the 1850s and 1860s made millions from slave owners taking out life insurance policies on the Africans enslaved on their plantations. In the 1840s and 1850s, one third of all life insurance policies from New York Life were policies on enslaved Africans. American International Group, which was founded in 1919 as American Asiatic Underwriters AAU in China, has become an American multinational finance and insurance corporation with operations in more than 80 countries and jurisdictions. They not only sell insurance to wealthy individuals and corporations, they insure governments. One of the oldest insurance companies that is now a part of AIG, because they bought it, began as US life insurance and was a major grantor of slave insurance. Continue. And of course, Lords of London apologized last year during the protests after the uh, murder of George Floyd. They apologized for their role in the Atlantic slave trade. I feel so much better. Um, next. Slave insurance was meant to make a profit for the insurance companies and to protect the wealth of the slave owners. Slave ship owners took out insurance policy, so did the cotton plantation owners, the sugar, rice, and tobacco plantation owners. There were even slave insurance policies taken off for enslaved Africans by coal mining companies. From Nancy Frantel, the historian who uncovered an un overwhelming number of slave insurance policies by coal mining companies in Virginia and South Carolina. This is a quote from her, her writing, her research. These policies provided a risk-free opportunity for the owners to lease slaves, but it was far from risk-free for the slaves who were work, forced to work in the extremely hazardous conditions of the mines. Insurance companies even wrote policies on 12-year-old slaves who labored underground in the mines. And here's the Virginia Life Insurance Company. And yes, they, slaves insured at low rates. Slide. So even here in Detroit, we have this story. If you could click it, or do I need to click it? Click me over here in this corner and play, yeah. We are now standing at the site of what used to be St. Anne du des Trois, which was the first Catholic church in the state of Michigan, built inside of the fort or post to train du des Trois. And so this fort had a church inside of it, a Catholic church. The French were Catholic and St. Anne's du des Trois was inside of the fort. Of course, there's been a number of rebuildings of St. Anne's, and the St. Anne's today is in southwest Detroit, and it's a humongous cathedral. But the original one was a very simple building that sat right inside of the fort. Now, it is there where we find the beginning or the earliest written record of a black person living in the city of Detroit. It's an unknown negress buried on the grounds of St. Anne's. That unknown negress, her name is not listed because the French inside of the fort did not list the name of the people who were enslaved. So this unknown negress, her name is not listed because she was enslaved, no doubt by the Kampal family. And so this woman who was enslaved was enslaved by the Kampals. She, was, she died and was buried inside of the fort. Today, Saint Anne, that original St. Anne's no longer sits here. This plaque is here to honor that history. The building that it sits on sit where the old St. Anne's used to be is now the Church of Scientology. So this is now the Church of Scientology that sits at the site of where St. Anne's was. All right, next slide. And so here in Detroit, we, st we have this tie to slavery. The Democratic Free Press and the Michigan Intelligencer, which was founded in May of 1831. You can push play. So Detroit, originally inhabited by indigenous people, the Anishinaabe being the largest group of people that were here when the French arrived in 1701. The French arrived in 1701 to have a fur trade and to monopolize the fur trade in this area. 
but they're knee deep in the slave trade. The slave trade is centered in the Caribbean at that time, and of course the Caribbean is sugar slavery. The French have their slave plantations on Martinique, Guadalupe, Saint-Domingue, French West India, and French West, French West Indies. The British are also in the Caribbean. They're on Barbados and in the Virgin Islands and in Jamaica. The Spanish are in the Caribbean. They're in Cuba and Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic. The Dutch are in the Caribbean, Curaçao and Suriname. The Portuguese are in Brazil. But well, all of these European powers are, you are um, involved in a large-scale enslavement of African people and Native Americans for sugar. Sugar plantation is the original crop for plantation slavery. When the French arrive in the 1700s, they're already knee-deep in this slave, slave trade, and they bring slavery to the city of Detroit with them. The Campa family being one of the largest slave owners of the French. Joseph Campa's sister, Cecile Campa, marries a British man whose last name is William, and they have a son named John William. John Williams is a pretty common name even to this day. It was a common name in Detroit at that time. So this, to distinguish himself from the other John Williams that lived in the city of Detroit, this John Williams, who's a Campa descendant, adds a middle initial to his name, John R. Williams. And John R., the R stands for nothing. It's just an R to be different than the other John Williams. Both John R. Williams and his uncle, Joseph Campbell are slave owners in the city of Detroit. And it is their money, it is their finances that start the oldest still existing business in the city of Detroit. It was founded in 1831 as the Democratic Free Press and the Michigan Intelligencer. You know it today simply as the Detroit Free Press. The Detroit Free Press was a pro-slavery newspaper in its early days. Why would it be? because the Democratic Party was a pro-slavery political organization at that time. The Republican Party would be founded on the issue of abolition. So the original Republican Party, which a number of Michiganders also founded, were abolitionists and radical Republicans who wanted black people to have full citizenship. And the Democratic Party in the 1830s is a pro-slavery party. During the Civil War, the free press is opposing Lincoln, they're opposing the Civil War, they're basically a Southern sympathizing newspaper. And they're anti-black and they're anti-emancipation. And this is the free press who will be the number one igniter of the 1863 race riot in the city of Detroit, which occurred on March 6, 1863 in downtown Detroit. Next slide. The free press will So. And so um, we didn't, I didn't, play him, but Lewis Cass, of course, was a slave owner illegally in the city of Detroit because he's an American. And after the, um, the Northwest Ordinance was passed, it outlawed slavery in the Northwest Territory, although the French and British were kind of grandfathered in and allowed to continue practicing slavery. Cass was not in, a, in Detroit at that time as a British person. He moved to the city of Detroit during this American period, so it's actually illegal for him to be a slave um, um, owner, but he does illegally practice slavery. And of course, um, he's buried at Elmwood Cemetery, so that's his burial site at Elmwood. And the Campaws are also buried in Elmwood Cemetery, and it's Joseph Campaws' um, actual burial site at Elmwood Cemetery. Next slide. So Detroit has another rich historical legacy, though. Just as there are streets, buildings, schools, monuments, and businesses tied to slave owners in Detroit and throughout the country, there are also institutions and organizations that are directly connected to the history of resistance against slavery. And they're here in Detroit too. When we teach about slavery, we cannot spend all of our time discussing the evil of the slave trade and the evil people who were a part of it. We must give at least equal time to the freedom fighters and the organizations that were set up by these freedom fighters. Next. And so the first institution out of the five that I'm gonna talk about is Second Baptist Church founded in 1836. And so that's how it looks today. That's an older, of course, picture of what it used to look like. And it's founded, of course, there, I'm, I'm not, we're not gonna read the whole thing, but on the market, it's founded in 1836 by 13 former slaves. Sharon Sexton will tell you that all of the people who founded um, Second Baptist Church were not enslaved. Some of them were, but not all 13. So 
So markers have errors on them, and that would be one. Um, but the first black school in the city of Detroit comes from out of Second Baptist. So I, black people didn't wait around for white people to give them an education. They founded their own institutions and were self-help uh, uh, community. They were a self-help community. They, they thought of ways to help themselves before they, the, the larger society said, you know what, we ought to be treating people equally. So black people created their own schools, their own church in 1836, Second Baptist Church. Still exists today, the oldest church in the state of Michigan, oldest African-American church in the state of Michigan. But also we want to see there that in 1843, they had the first state convention of colored citizens occurred at Second Baptist Church, and the delegates there demanded the right to vote and an end to slavery, and also education, and a few other things at this state convention. What, we, what they're really talking about is civil rights. They're talking beyond just ending slavery. So they're beyond just abolition by itself. They're talking about being full citizens, what we would later call the civil rights movement. There, there's a civil rights movement within the abolitionist movement at the same time in the city of Detroit. Continue. Next slide. And so, so let's read a little bit of the marker. I already talked about the 1843 convention. I already talked about the, what the delegates are demanding. And what they're really calling for is civil rights. As my son sits there, he's now in college, so he's no longer that little. All right. The first time we have a record of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. visiting Second Baptist Church in 19, is in 1945, when he's only 16 years old. He's graduated from high school. He's a student at Morehouse College. He's visiting Detroit with his father, Martin Luther King Sr., who was in Detroit for the National Baptist Convention, and King Sr. would deliver a sermon at Second Baptist Church. Another preacher is in town in 1945, the same time as the King family, and he's here for the National Baptist Convention too. He'll be brought on as a pastor and will move here with his family, not a pastor at Second Baptist, but another black church in Detroit. That pastor's name is C.L. Franklin. King's father and grandfather, A.D. Williams, are highly respected in the National Baptist Convention and are invited to speak in Michigan many times. King's father, King Jr.'s father, will arrange for his son to speak in dozens of pulpits even when he is in college. In February of 1954, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. will speak twice in Michigan. He will also speak in Michigan again that same, that same year in March. On February 4th, he speaks at his uncle, Joel, Joel Lawrence King's church in Lansing. On February 28th, he speaks at Second Baptist Church in Detroit. After that sermon, he visits his uncle in Lansing again and speaks to the Lansing NAACP. So there's been no Montgomery bus boycott yet, but he's speaking here, speaking in Lansing, speaking to the NAACP, and he's not yet a civil rights leader. On March 15th, he would deliver three sermons at his uncle's church in Lansing. His morning sermon, as well as his sermon at Second Baptist, would be played on the Lansing radio show, Hour of Faith. Next slide. And this is what he says in that, that first sermon he gives at Second Baptist in 1954. Um, Reverend Simmons, platform associates, members and friends of Second Baptist Church, I need not pause to say how happy I am to be here this morning and to be part of this worship service. It's certainly with a deal of humility that I stand in the pulpit, this pulpit so rich in tradition and history. What is he talking about tradition and history? King is referring to the history of Second Baptist Church as the first black church in Michigan and its history on the Underground Railroad. That's what he's talking about, rich in tradition and history. Second Baptist Church, as you know, has the reputation of being one of the great churches of our nation. And it is certainly a challenge that for me to stand here this morning to be in the pulpit of Reverend Banks and of a people who are so great and rich in tradition. I'm not exactly a stranger in the city of Detroit, for I've been here several times before. And I remember back in about 1944 or 45, we know it's 45, um, somewhere back in there that I came to Second Baptist Church for the first time. I think that was the year that the National Baptist Convention met here. That's how I found out which year it was, because I had to find out which year the National Baptist Convention was. Um, but King is referring to the great ministers at Second Baptist, especially Robert Bradby and A.A. A. Banks. King speaks of his first time visiting Second Baptist. Bradby was the pastor then during the National Baptist Convention. King was 16 years old at that time. And of course, I have a lot of relatives in this city, so that Detroit is really something of a second home for me. And I don't feel too much a stranger here this morning. So it is, a, it is indeed a pleasure and a privilege for me to be in this city this morning and to be here to worship with you in the absence of your very fine and noble pastor, Dr. Banks. King's aunt, 
his father's sister, Woody Clara King Brown, and her husband Jerome Brown, and their children all lived in the city of Detroit. Also, his father's youngest brother, Joel Lawrence King, and his wife and children live in Lansing. I want you to think with me this morning from the subject, rediscovering lost values. Rediscovering lost values. There's something wrong with our world, something fundamentally and basically wrong. I don't think we have to look too far to see that. Look too far? Uh, I'm sure that you would agree with me in making that assertion. And when we stop to analyze the cause of our world's ills, many things come to mind. That's from his speech, his sermon. And he's talking about you don't have to look too far. What's this sermon about? Next slide. Five years prior, the federal government had passed the National Housing Act of 1949, which began the destruction of Black Bottom. And Second Baptist is sitting right down the street from Hastings, right, in, right at the edge of Black Bottom. Uh, so this begins the destruction of Black Bottom and the dislocation of African Americans from that community. So when he says you don't have to look too far, he's talking about this neighborhood is being destroyed in, right in front of us. Second Baptist is feeling the effects of this at the time the King is there. He's already graduated from Crozer Theological Seminary and his doctoral dissertation has just been accepted at Boston University. He's going to attend Boston University to attain his PhD. Dr. King has just gotten married about eight months ago Coretta Scott King, to Coretta Scott King. Him and, and her and Dr. King met in Boston in their newlyweds. While they are still living in Boston as, as students, there's major tension in Montgomery, Alabama around segregation on the buses. King will move to Montgomery in September of 1954 and become the pastor at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. He will get involved in the Montgomery bus boycott and Second Baptist Church will send over $2,600 to the Montgomery bus boycott, more than any other church in the country. They will send an additional $1,500 to help the churches at home that had been bombed, including King's home that had been bombed in Montgomery during the boycott. So they, they were an underground railroad church, civil rights church. Bethel AME, number two. So that's the old Bethel AME. This is what it looks like today. All right. Continue. What comes out of Bethel AME? A whole bunch of organizations. And one of them is so important that I'm going to make it number three. And it's the Booker T. Washington Trade Association and the Detroit Housewives League, which really kind of started as one organization in the 1930s. The women were part of the Detroit Housewives League. The men were the Booker T. Washington um, Trade Association, which is now the Booker T. Washington Business Association. Two of the leaders, there's Nanny Black and there's Fannie Peck. Fannie Peck is the pastor's wife of, second, of um, Bethel AME. The pastor is William Peck. He's the founder of the Booker T. Washington Trade Association. Continue. So they had their, this is in 1948 when they had the expo at the, um, um, at, at the convention hall, which I don't even know where that's at, at, where the convention hall was in the city of Detroit at that time, because it's 1948, so it wasn't, Kobo wasn't built yet. Um, Kobo's not even become, he's not even been elected mayor yet, so they don't have anything named after him yet. But I don't know where that convention hall would have been, but that's, they, they're having an expo, really a business ex expo. And then here they are, Booker T. Washington Trade Association, Detroit Housewife League, 571 Frederick Street. What is that? That's, that's Bethel AME. That's where they are. They're not yet on Warren and St. Antoine, which is around the corner. They're across the street from Dunbar Hospital. It's a big empty field there today. So if you go down Frederick Street, you see that big empty field. That's where Bethel AME was prior to them building the new structure in 1977. And that's also the, 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 where the Booker T. Washington Trade Association, Detroit Housewives, that's their address because they come out of that church. Continue. And so there's William Peck and there's Fannie Peck. And here they're having a meeting at the Cozy Corner, which is on Hastings Street, 4100 Hastings Street. This is the model of the Detroit Housewives League, build black businesses. That means start some that don't exist already. Boost black businesses. That means support the ones that already exist and buy from black businesses. And so we want to expand the black business that already exists and buy from black businesses. They're protesting and boycotting racist businesses. This is in the 1930s. We're not talking about the 1960s. And this is right in the city of Detroit. But Bethel AME, which is where this organization comes from, is one of the underground railroad churches. Continue. 
And so there's Fanny Peck. There's the organization that she founded. Continue. And you can see the people at the meeting. That woman up there, her name is Helen Malloy. We'll talk about her in a minute. Here's the membership application. Continue. Look at the meeting. You know, it's, you know they mean business because everybody got their hats on. <laughs> and then they got the young girls in the back who are listening to the elders. They're, they're um, passing this baton. They're letting them know you're going to be a part of this at one point, at some point. Continue. One of the members was Sylvia Tucker in 1938. She was the president of the Detroit chapter of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History. She raised more money for that organization than anyone else. She organized chapters in Flint, Lansing, and Ann Arbor. She was crowned Miss Negro History. After the bombing of Pearl Harbor, she went to give blood at the local Red Cross. The Red Cross discriminated against black blood and turned her away. She wrote a letter to Eleanor Roosevelt in protest of the discrimination of black blood. This led to the acceptance but continued segregation of black blood in 1942 and eventually the official end of segregated blood in 1950. In the 1950s and 60s, Tucker and Arthur Core, who, was, who had become the new president of the Detroit branch of the Association for the Study of, at that time, was Afro-American life in history, would lead a campaign to bring African art into the DIA. In 1962, due largely to their efforts, the African Art Gallery would be formed. Today, the African Art Gallery Committee is known as the Friends of African and African-American Art at the DIA. That organization comes out of, the, uh, out of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. We call it ASALA today. But ASALA in Detroit comes out of um, um, Bethel AME. Continue. There's the article in the Detroit Tribune about the protest against um, discrimination against black blood. Continue. That's Arthur Core, who became the president of ASALA. And there he is at the historic marker because he was the leader of Asala at the same time that this, they, they pushed for this marker to be put at the corner of St. Antoine and Congress, which, of course, is the marker for the Frederick Douglass and John Brown meeting, bringing it right back to this movement, the Underground Railroad. They understood the connection between the two. All right, continue. And then, of course, there's the, the article he wrote for the Negro History Bulletin about his his um, um, fundraising drive for the African art at the DIA. Continue. Rosa Slade Gregg is also a member of the Detroit Housewives League. She, but she will become the leader of the Detroit Association of Colored Women's Club and also a member of Bethel AME. Um, she will be a leader of the Detroit Association of Colored Women's Club in 1940. She's an advisor to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt. She opens the first civilian defense office in Detroit. She's the founder of the first vocational school for African Americans in Detroit, the Slade Gregg Academy of Practical Arts in 1947. She establishes the youth center, the library, and the archives at Bethel AME. Many of those archives end up being donated to the Bentley. So the Bentley get, has most of the history of Bethel AME, but who coordinated it so that it could be donated was this woman, Rosa Slade Gregg. Um, in 1950, she becomes the president of the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs. In 1961, she's an advisor to President John F. Kennedy. In 1963, she's an advisor to President Lyndon B. Johnson. She died in 1989. And that's the article after she passed away. Next. In 1921, eight black women's clubs came together to form the Detroit Association of Colored Women's Clubs. The organization raised funds for the poor. They assisted local churches. They did a lot of stuff. I'm not going to read all of that. In 1945, they built, they bought the William Lenane House on Ferry Street. The address is 321 East Ferry Street. But Ferry Street homes have racially restrictive covenants. The group has the front door blocked in and builds an entrance on the Brush Street side. The address is changed from a Ferry Street address to a Brush Street address. Brush Street has no racially restrictive covenant. The leader of the organization at that time was Rosa Slade Gregg. That's the house. You can see the front porch closed in. And they destroyed the walkway. And you see they built another walkway and door on the side of the building. They still own the the building to this day. Next slide. There she is at the inauguration of John F. Kennedy, uh, one of his uh, inauguration parties. There she is talking to Lyndon Johnson. There she is talking to um, President Kennedy. And then, of course, talking to the First Lady Jackie Kennedy. Next. And then we did, did an honorary naming of the street um, two years ago. We honorarily named the street in her honor. That's her grandma, granddaughter unveiling 
the honorary street name, and that's me holding the ladder. Next. Violet Lewis, also a member of Bethel AME, also a member of the Detroit Housewives League. She founds Lewis College of Business, the first historically black college university in the state of Michigan. Continue. Helen Malloy, another member of Bethel AME, she's a founding member of the Detroit Housewives League. She lived in the North End. She adopted a girl who had been born to a teenage mother. She sent that child to Northern High School. She paid for that young woman to attend Tuskegee. That young woman left Tuskegee because she couldn't deal with racism once she left Tuskegee's campus. You in 1950s Alabama, and that young lady didn't want to deal with that. So she left and moved to Brooklyn to attend nursing, nursing school. And while she was in Brooklyn, her and the minister began courting. They got married in 1958. That's Helen Malloy. This is her shoe company, her shoe store, her and her husband's shoe store. They had two. This one is the one attached to the Brewsters. So it's on Hastings, but it's at the Brewsters, 349 Hastings Street. This is the young girl she, she adopted who's working in the store, Betty and customer selling men's homes. So that's the girl she adopted. Her name is Betty. She's 12 years old in that picture. Next. That's Betty Shabazz. That's the girl she raised. Uh, that's, and there's Helen Malloy. Next. And so you see them all now. Fanny Peck, Helen Malloy, Sylvia Tucker, Rosa Slade Gregg is kind of hiding behind the people back there. Nanny Black. Uh, and um, Violet Lewis. Continue. The Lamberts. We all should know this. And we saw this marker earlier. This marker was stolen in 2016. In 2016, we lost four markers in the city of Detroit. We lost the William Lambert marker. For a while, we didn't have the William Webb, the meeting of Frederick Douglass and John Brown marker, and the founding of Temple Bethel marker. They were right next to each other. And um, what was the other marker? It was four. Oh, I forgot what the other marker was. But we got the. Um, so, that, so the Dunbar marker was stolen before 2016, but you're right. That one's gone, but I, it was four that let, we lost in 2016. For some reason, I'm drawing a blank on what that fourth one was. But um, William Lambert was stolen. The other two, we, what we learned or what we were told is that they were damaged. They were destroyed in a car accident. And so they've been replaced. So we got two replaced, but William Lambert's marker is still missing. And, uh, and so we need to get that marker replaced. It's, he's one of the most important, his family is one of the most important families in the fight for freedom in American history, but definitely in Detroit. Continue. So the home of the Lamberts was located at 497 Larnett. They owned a number of businesses. The first one was at Griswold and 4th Street, then another business on Brush and Larnett. They then moved the business, which was tailoring, clothes repair, tanning and cleaning, to 273 Jefferson. That site is now occupied by the Coleman and Young Municipal Center. At the time of William Lambert's death, he owned property worth $75,000. That would be over $2 million in today's dollars. Continue. And so what William Steele is doing in Philadelphia is what people like William Lambert and his wife Julia Lambert are doing in the city of Detroit. You have wealthy black people who are financing the Underground Railroad because the Kellogg Foundation isn't giving out grants for the Underground Railroad. All right. So there is William Lambert and his wife Julia Willoughby Lambert. Always, when you, when you can and when you know, you must talk about these women because there's never been a time when black people have made progress in America's history and women weren't at the forefront of that progress. So if you're talking about the history and you're leaving the women out, you ain't talking about the history, all right? So we, the, when the history happened, women were doing all this stuff. When we talk about it, we tell it as if men did it all. Next. So the number four is St. Matthew's Episcopal Church. That's the original site at the corner of St. Antoine and Congress. You can see um, St. Peter and Paul Catholic Church right there. They will move from that site and be in the Paradise Valley neighborhood. That's, that's the same. These two is the same. 
And then, of course, they merged with St. Joseph's, and they're now on Woodward um, in the North End. Continue. Um, I'm not going to read all this. There was a civil rights organization called the National Afro-American Council, and Detroit was a major, um, had members that were a part of it. Um, and the meeting in Detroit was in 1905. That's when the Detroit meeting occurred. So this, they precede the NAACP. Continue. Who was at that meeting? Benjamin Pelham was at the meeting. He was the publisher, one of the publishers of the first black newspaper in Detroit, um, the Detroit Plain Dealer. D. Augustus Straker was at that meeting. He was a civil rights attorney. Um, and there was a bunch of other people at the meeting. Another person at the meeting was a man named William Olsby, um, who was also on the board of Dunbar Hospital. And who else was at that meeting? Benjamin Willoughby Lambert was at the meeting. And Benjamin Willoughby Lambert, they won't form a, a national Afro-American council in Detroit. Or if they do, it doesn't last long. But they become the founders of the Detroit branch of the NAACP. Benjamin Lambert is the son of Underground Railroad leaders William Lambert and Julia Willoughby Lambert. You go from the Underground Railroad to the Civil Rights Movement in one family in one generation. Here it is. It's found, the, it's found, the Detroit branch of NAACP was organized in the basement of St. Matthew's Episcopal Church. The Lamberts are two of the founders of St. Matthew's Episcopal Church. St. Matthew's comes out of that Underground Railroad history. It was a station on the Underground Railroad, and now it's where the NAACP in Detroit is founded. So number five is the Detroit branch of the NAACP. Who is a member, whose family is a member of St. Matthew's when the NAACP is having some of their meetings there? Gladys Sweet, the wife of Dr. Ocean Sweet. And we know that a mob will attack their home, a white mob not wanting them to live there, and first, the Detroit NAACP will get involved, but eventually the national NAACP is in, will get involved. We don't know if that would have happened had that happened at a different church with a different family. But the connections of that family to St. Matthew's and St. Matthew's connection to the NAACP and the NAACP is founded at St. Matthew's, which is connected to the Underground Railroad, is a part of all of this history. That's the fifth of the Detroit institutions that come directly out of the Underground Railroad. Thank you. Last slide. I say thank you, everybody. And I got a couple of minutes, maybe, to answer a couple of questions or take a couple of comments if anybody would like to. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And, and congrats. And, much, much respect to you. I was, again, I was a social studies teacher for 20 years, and I began doing this because my students were missing Detroit's history, particularly its African American history. Thank you. So you said your son is in college now, right? Yes. Which yes. college is he going to now? Yes. Um, the son you saw, Joshua, is attending Wayne State University. Okay. So he's at Wayne State. My, um, I have other children who've gone to college, so my two eldest have graduated. He's just entering. They graduated. Well, one graduated from here, U of M, and the other graduated from Michigan State University. Did you say you teach a class here at U of I do. I teach a class here at U of M. Can you explain it's not, on that? Okay, so I teach a class at, for U of M, so I'm on the U of M faculty, but I don't teach here at, at Ann Arbor. I, that class is in Detroit at the U of M Detroit Center. Uh, it is basically a Detroit black history class. Um, so I, yep, I teach that. Um, it's one, one class a week, three hours. And ho when, hopefully I'll be teaching it at some, other, at some other semester. And if you know about it and you have a chance or you know someone who has a chance to enroll in it, please do. Yep. Any other questions? Comments. Are you working on anything else, like right now, with the new stuff coming up now, related to the past? I heard you say that a couple of times. Yeah, yeah. So, um, to, uh, I mean, one thing I'm going to be doing, I, I, I run, I, I'm Black Scroll Network History and Tours. I, I run the tours at the company. 
And I started this company in 2013. I lead tours and lectures dealing with African American history. You can go to our website. I wasn't smart enough, like Roy, to put my <laughs> contact information on the last slide. Um, but if you Google Black Scroll Detroit, all my stuff will pop up. So just, just do that. And you can join a public tour. I'm doing a lot of virtual stuff tours. So that means you don't even have to leave your house. You can take a virtual tour with me. You kind of saw a clip of a virtual tour, a couple of clips from a virtual tour. That's what that was when you saw me in front of where St. Anne's used to be and where free, the free press used to be. That's, that's what I do with my virtual tours. I record myself at these sites. And, and then you can join a virtual tour and you get to see those places and hear me talk about the history there. Thank you.